Right, let's get on to talk about cycling uh, rather than quarantine and all that sort of thing. Let's start with the big Ineos news that broke whenever it was a few days ago. And bear in mind, by the way, we're recording this on Sunday morning. So everything we say from Sunday afternoon onwards will be completely out of date. Uh, bear that in mind. But a few days ago, um, Team Ineos announced that neither Geraint Thomas nor Chris Froome, the two former tour winners, were going to be in the team. Hand on heart. In fact, just a show of hands, right? Who was actually surprised by that announcement? Zero hands go up. Um, Matt, you felt, I felt like you were about to say something there. What were you about to say about it? Well, I, I don't know if I was surpri surprised or not surprised. I, I was surprised by Geraint's lack of form, uh, I suppose. Uh, and, but the funny thing is that Geraint's always been, you know, as Dave Brailsford's always said, Geraint's always been the first name on the list. And so that seemed to me to be surprising. Uh, Chris... I mean, could have, could have been dead a year ago. I think none of us yeah. were. Sorry, I think we weren't. Maybe not surprised, but I didn't see it. I didn't see it coming at the same time. When I read it, I was like, "Oh yeah, of course they're not in the tour team." But I, I wouldn't have called it, you know, the day before it happened. Um, like, okay, I wasn't surprised that when when it happened, I was like, "Yeah, of course that's Dave Brailsford all over." You know, he sends the best eight guys to the Tour de France, and it just goes to show it doesn't matter what your name is and what you've done in the past. That's how ruthless he is when it comes to winning the tour. But for sure, I did not see it coming, but I wasn't surprised, if that makes sense. Well, Patrick, I'd like to bring you in just very briefly to kind of like tell us what you know about the numbers and, and you know, the shortfall, obviously, that they both they, they both suffer from. But David, I think you and I were commentating for ITV at the Dauphiné, and clearly that was a big story every day, that how early on the climbs both of them dropped away, and particularly Geraint. But... Um, in our calculations about whether or not Thomas, in particular, might make the team, I think the thing that neither of us had, neither of us had, uh, <laughs> you've just got a bit of company in your room there, that neither of us had kind of like factored in was that Dave Brailsford might go and raid the Giro team to make up the numbers for the tour team. And that was the difference in that announcement, wasn't it? I hadn't seen that bit coming, that he would just go, oh, do you know what, Carapaz will move him across. That was the surprise for me. Yeah, that was a surprise. And I think it's also, that's, that goes to show with this condensed season that we forgot that was an option. You kind of, I still have in my head, it's June at the moment for some reason, uh, kind of stuck in that, the classic seasonal time frame, which means normally you would never think, you don't comprehend that you could take somebody out of the Giro and put them in tour and they'd be on X, the same form. But it's because the Giro is only a month away. Actually, Carapaz and that team was actually equally ready for the Tour de France as they were the Giro arguably perhaps more so because they haven't had a stressful build-up they haven't had all the expectations and weight of the world on their shoulders so yeah you're right that wasn't something i think that any of us comprehended and as pete said yeah in hindsight the moment it happens you think that makes sense don't take Geraintum and uh, chris but we actually forgot that it's a totally pragmatic and rational decision because you've got people in the wing who are going to the giro to win the giro so yeah classic team ineos classic team ineos um Patrick, what did you make of the Dauphin in terms of the, you know, what you saw from the data and the numbers and the, and I guess also the big sort of showdown between Jumbo Visma and Ineos that will continue into the Tour de France. I guess for me, it was a case of Occam's Razor. There was some narratives around how Froome and Thomas were somehow riding to a prescribed TSS, and it was all part of a peaking plan to pull out of their own train a third of the way up the first hard climb of the day. Uh, whereas I looked at it as they're not, you know, Thomas said he's a kilo or two kilos overweight. Well, if you're a kilo overweight, sure, you might not contest the finale with Roglic on magic form, but you're not getting dropped by your own domestiques. You know, Froome got dropped by Kwiatkowski. Thomas couldn't pull very hard for Bernal. Admittedly, when I did the numbers, Dylan Van Baal and Castroviejo and Kwiatkowski, they were doing, like, they were going super hard in that Dauphiné stage two stage, which was the real showdown when everyone was before the crashes, etc. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I'm, I was surprised that Thomas was left out, mainly because this is a guy that won the Tour in 2018. He came second last year uh, and second by a fair margin too as well. Um, and he's not even good enough to be picked as a domestique to support Bernal in this year's Tour de France. So... I guess my question is, how's that happened? Like, could he, he, I understand he could train outside the whole time. I just don't know what happened. Pete, do you think that some, it, to some extent, has 
at, at least the way that Jumbo Visma have raised their game and the threat that they clearly posed in the Dauphiné actually forced the hand of Ineos. Like if you took Jumbo Visma out of the equation and just looked at the way that that Dauphiné team for Ineos had performed, then maybe Thomas or even Froome would have still had a chance. But it was the pressure that Jumbo Visma applied to the entire selection process that, yeah. that, that made them sort of reach that dramatic conclusion, perhaps. I mean, Visma obviously did expose weaknesses weaknesses in Ineos' team. Um, but it's quite what they've done, Jumbo Visma, really, is basically just replicated what, what Ineos and Sky have done, where they've, they've, you know, signed GC winners in their own right and then just used them as super domestiques on the climbs. And they've, they've turned up to the, this year's Dauphiné and really the first time ever that there's been a team who's been able to take it to Ineos as a team. And um, it was amazing to see. It's going to be interesting to see if they can carry that through um, to the Tour de France. But I think in terms of with G, it's, it's an interesting one. The whole season's different. You've got to remember in March, no one actually knew what the season was going to look like, what when they were even going to start racing. Okay, they had an idea, but it wasn't, it wasn't set in stone. So you have, to, you have to bear that in mind. Everyone's different. Everyone handles things differently. Um, and I think usually with the way the season is and where the Tour de France is placed in the season, if G turns up to Trentino or Terreno Adriatico and he's a bit below, bit below form, it's a kind of a bit of a, you know, a kick in the arse. And then it's, he, he's still got time to prepare for the Tour de France. But really, they only had two races to, to show themselves and that leaves you no time to, to really put extra work in or do an extra altitude camp um, to build up and be at the Tour de France or the Dauphiné in, in your top form. Let's talk about the Tour de France, David. Let's talk about the Tour de France. I remember when the route was announced. Look, I've started to make, started to make some little notes here. When the route was announced, um, I remember messaging you and you looked at that kind of map and I think we both went, ooh, What's happened to the north of France? It's really, really, it's such a strange route, isn't it? I mean, what, what do you make of it? I think it's really good. I mean, it's, it's very much a, immediately going off the Tour de France. The Volta Espana is like that this year as well. It's all congregated in the northwest of Spain, though, contrary to France this year on the north, southeast. I think it's great. Uh, but my initial, th- my initial and selfish thing was, oh, transfers are going to be good. Like if we were there, <laughs> so we're not going all over the place. But actually, looking at that terrain and knowing it down there, that's going to make an incredibly hard race because you've got the heat the whole time. You've got the, it's always there's so so many mountains. There's we're, we're kind of mixed. Oh, sorry, the dogs, the dogs are going nuts. Um, uh, and there's the the fact that you've got the rolling country around there. I just think that it's it is a quite a unique course, and it's not going to make for easy racing. It's, it's daunting, uh, but at the same time, I think it's quite good for the race itself because you're not going to have all those huge transfers, which do put a lot of stress on everybody at the race, including the riders and the personnel. So, yeah, it's unique, and hopefully that offers a unique race. Uh, Patrick, what do you what do you what do you make of this route? It is kind of unusual, isn't it, and in lots of different ways. Reminds me of a Vuelta route, I think, as David mentioned. First week's hard, uh, harder than a normal cruisy Tour de France with maybe five or four pure sprint stages. I think when the route got announced about two weeks later, Jumbo Visma came out and said, yeah, Dylan Kronewegen's not coming because he's not going to get around this. And they said he's going to go to the Giro. Obviously, things have happened since then, but that shows how hard this course is. I think Cavendish said in his tweet yesterday, he referenced that, how it's one of the hardest tour profiles he's ever seen or in his career. And I think that fed into the Ineos decision and why it was obviously, it's obviously the correct decision, the decision Ineos has made because the Giro parkour suits Thomas way more. This Tour de France parkour suits Carapath more in my view. Carapath, not a fantastic time trials. Carapath, probably the second best punchy rider at the end of a mountaintop finish below altitude um, after Roglic in the world. We saw what he did in Tour de Pologne, I think it was, like a month ago when he won... Uh, what was going to be a sprint. He won that Giro d'Italia sprint stage ahead of, not a sprint stage, in a break ahead of Caleb Ewan. So these sort of punchy stages, he's just another string to Ineos' bow where they can maybe, yes, he's an outsider, but they can try and get him into a break like Movistar did with Quintana and uh, Landa last year and put pressure on Jumbo Visma that way uh, and force them to chase if he gets into a really large break and maybe a transitional stage. 
Yeah, yeah. Pete, you've had a bit of time to digest it now, haven't you, this morning, looking over it again. What what stands out for you about, about the route? Yeah, I think they're a good point about Carapaz, actually. Just mentioned there that I haven't, hadn't even thought of. Such a, like you said, the way he sort of proved himself in Poland and the kick he does have, it is someone who can go up against Rob Glitch at the end of these, some of these punchy mountain stages. But I think, probably for me, the first, just how early the first mountain stage is compared to... Stage two. Previous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like you've got really no time to sort of, not that it's ever easy the first week in the Tour de France, but no real time to ride into it at all. You've got to be on the money straight away, basically. And then also the the time trial. Well, the lack of time trial for a starter, but then just the, the way it's placed in the race. Obviously, the last real stage um, and what we've seen in the Dauphiné at the minute, everyone's so close on the mountain stages, there's really not much between them. So I think it'd be an amazing, amazing race if it came down to that last time trial. We've talked about the route. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I, do, I, I just want to, you know, for the benefit of, of our viewers, we've concentrated for perhaps good reasons on the Ineos uh, Jumbo Visma, um, uh, you know, lineups and Roglic's dominance and the, the dominant team. Also, by the way, Wout van Aert, who will clearly be the first yellow jersey of this Tour de France after stage one. Um, and um, thank you, Matt, for mentioning Thibaut Pino because he could very well win this bicycle race. But the list of kind of like, if you like, Riders who can be disruptive, who could really do something, who could be a big surprise package and ride themselves into form in this very unpredictable edition of the race is endlessly long. Alaphilippe, Soler, Valverde, Enric Mas, Mikel Lander, you mentioned him, Fabio Aru, Tadej Pogaccia, Guilla Martin from Cofidis, Dan Martin, Thibaut Pino, Adam Yates, who is moving to Ineos next year and has shown us nothing yet of what his form might be. I think he's a mystery man. Roman Bardet, Richie Port, Roglic Dumoulin, Emmanuel Buchmann, however injured he may be from the, from the Dauphiné. Then we've got Danny Martinez, Rigoberto Uran, Sergio Iguita, Miguel Angel Lopez, Nairo Quintana, before we even come to Carapaz and Bernal. That is a mouth-watering prospect, isn't it? Patrick, um, you know, it's as strong a start list at the Tour de France in the absence of those riders focusing on the Giro as I can ever remember. Yeah, and I think I'm not sure if you mentioned Guillaume Martin as well. I think yeah, you, I did. You mentioned him. Sorry, He's, yeah, I'm well, a big I, I fan. I, I'm actually I president of the him. United Kingdom Guillaume Martin <laughs> fan club. So uh, yeah, yeah I he, definitely. He mentioned did really, him. he did really well in that uh, Mont Ventoux challenge behind Alexander Vlasov, the Russian Ferrestano is absolutely flying. So Guillaume Martin will be up there. I think he'll get a top ten on GC, but I, I still think it's pretty clearly a two horse race the Tour de France at the moment, between Roglic and Bernal. Roglic is the favourite in the markets. Pino is third favourite, and there's a bit of a gap to him as well. But Dumoulin, it's been a bad news story. I think the Dauphiné overall wasn't good for Jumbo Visma. They lost Kreuzweik in the crash. I actually think Roglic is more hurt than people think. Um, he put up a really weird Instagram post the other day that uh, people were like, I was surprised by it anyway. Um, so his, his preparation has definitely been disrupted um, and I'll believe he starts when he starts, to be honest, uh, Roglic. So Buchmann obviously has been injured. So it was shaping up to end of stage two Dauphiné. It looked like it was going to be a real heavyweight battle between Pino, Buchmann, Bernal, Roglic, etc. But yeah, all those injuries have kind of, I don't know. I, I actually don't know what everyone's going to look like in week one because everyone's had a disrupted preparation. They've all had crashes. Bernal had the back injury, which I kind of think was not a real injury, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it looks like a two-horse race to me between two clearly stronger teams than the other teams, which I think Richie Port said something similar. He said both Jumbo Visma and Ineos are just on a different level to everyone, everyone else. But it'll be interesting. I think Pino and if Bookman's there, they'll be aggressive and attack early. Bernal's never dropped anyone of Thibaut Pino's caliber below altitude before, so Pino dropped him multiple times below altitude in Tour de France last year. So yeah, it'll be it'll be super interesting. Obviously, there's not much high altitude in this year's Tour de France. No, that's right. Um, uh, that's very true, and a good analysis too. Right, our time is probably up. Um, it is a, a lot of uncertainties, not least, I think, the now quite well-established fact that uh, there appears to be absolutely no regulation from the race organisers as to when the race actually constitutes a race. If, God forbid, 
uh, positive tests on the COVID front actually mean that the race is curtailed or cut short, then what will happen is that the the uh, panel of commissaires will get together with the race organisers, ASO, and frankly, just decide amongst themselves uh, whether or not Julien Alaphilippe, who may be in the yellow jersey, has won the Tour de France after seven stages. So that is the most cycling thing I have ever heard. Uh, none of us know. <laughs> <laughs> None of us know actually when the race is going to be declared a race. Um, but uh, we say this, David, maybe give you the final word since we're going to be locked together in a commentary booth uh, f for, the, for a month to come. The one thing we always know about the Tour de France, and it's been borne out by the recent history of the race, is something massively unexpected will happen. And that is pretty much the only certainty we have. Yeah, I agree. I think this is going to be, we always go into the Tour de France with such uh, expectations and predictions. Uh, and more often than not, they get ripped up and, and thrown in the air. And I think this is probably the most random Tour de France we're going to have possibly uh, in a generation because we have, as you pointed out, that great list of riders. We saw how the race was raced last year, which I think has inspired many teams and riders to have hope. Thibaut Pino does go in as a legit contender. Philippe, we don't know. And I just think that if there's going to be one Tour de France worth watching every day, and especially with this weird route, because it is a bit weird, it looks kind of, we think it's a bit Vuelta. We, at first it looks back heavy, but actually, as you say, you look at it, it's, it's heavy in the middle. It's all in the southeast. We don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic and COVID. It's It could be uh, 21 one-day races, and that's very much what we saw last year. And if that's the case, it's going to be fabulous. All right. Um, Patrick, thank you very much for joining us uh, from Brisbane. I think you'll be contributing throughout the month and uh, look forward to that. Thank you for your insight. Pete, get yourself off the Isle of Man and uh, down here and come and join us in commentary. Matt, likewise, smart haircuts. I expect uh, similarly smart work from you throughout the Tour de France. And David, um, yeah, as I say, a couple of days of quarantine commentary and then see you in the flesh fairly soon.